What's up, Salt Strong Nation? Joe Simons, like diamonds, back again. We just had an amazing trip with Moat at Moat Aquaculture Center. Moat Marine, an amazing group out of Sarasota. If you don't follow them on Instagram, definitely check them out. They have an entire monster aquarium in a really, really cool facility there. And so today, we teamed up with Moat and FWC to release 2,500 little baby snook. For all of you here in Florida, that should get us pumped up. And they're doing this all the time, by the way. And we got to see everything really from start to finish. So this entire podcast, we're obviously have a video version as well. It's gonna start at Moat Aquaculture Center outside of Sarasota. And Justin's gonna kind of lead this tour where you can see everything from how they're tagging these little baby snook. And we even get to, get to see the, the breeding grounds where they're literally like creating like a perfect breeding scenario for these fish. You get to see some redfish breeding as well that they're doing. And then we're gonna take these 2,500 snook that are all a little tagged and put them in a big, I don't know, it's a, it's a monster truck that holds 2,500 little baby snook. We're gonna take it on the, on, on the interstate and literally go south to a hidden location that only a few people know about. And we are gonna take these little snook, put them in coolers, then put them in a little Ranger four wheel drive and take them out to the launch site. It is really, really cool. And, and apologize real quickly for some of the audio. It's just in the very beginning, uh, one of the scientists was not mic'd up yet. So you, you might hear a little bit, but it goes away quickly. We get everyone mic'd up shortly after that. So I apologize that in advance. Enjoy this amazing day with Moat. You are gonna learn a ton about how they are recreating the snook inside a facility and then helping our fish population out. Enjoy. What's going on, Salt Strong Nation? This is Justin, and today we got something really awesome for you. We are at Moat Aquaculture Park out in Sarasota. I've got Dr. Ryan with me here today, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna tag and help release juvenile snook. It's gonna be awesome. This is a huge operation out here in Sarasota. Uh, we're gonna look at what stock enhancement looks like and bringing snook back out into the population for a lot of you anglers to enjoy here in Florida. So Dr. Ryan, what are we looking at right now? Where are we and what are we doing? Right now we are in our grow facility. This is the facility that we're really holding these snook, growing them into those sizes that we like to release. We like to release the snook at about six to eight inches in length because larger fish have higher post-release survival. So we've been holding these fish out here, growing them up until the conditions are right so that we can put them out into the water. Here you see our team of staff, researchers, volunteers, scanning these fish, looking for tags that we put in them a month ago that help us monitor their movement and survival once they go out into the water. So they're catching all the snook out of these tanks. They process them, look at their lengths, look at the number of fish that have those tags, and that helps us follow this cohort through their life in the wild. We tag all of our fish with two different tag types. So you'll see we have two different detectors at each of these stations. They are first determining whether or not these fish have a pit tag. That's a passive integrated transponder tag. We use that tag to get very specific information about each and every individual that has that uh, unique identification. It works just like the microchips that may be in your cat or dog back home. And all the work we do is trying to identify what are the factors in the field and in the hatchery that impact the survival of these fish once we put them out into the water. And as they grow, because these pit tags are lifelong tags, uh, we're actually able to monitor that movement throughout the life of the fish. We have recaptured fish that we pit tagged and released eight years after the fact. We've actually caught them right at the same release site that we had put them into the water several years prior. We have antenna array systems in North Creek, Anger Creek, and in the Tippecanoe Environmental Park as well. Today, the fish that we're releasing will go into the Tippecanoe Environmental Park in Anger Creek systems. We started releasing there as a response to red tide. We wanted to be able to give those populations that had been highly impacted by red tide mortality a jump start on the way to recovery. The other tag type that we use is a coated wire tag. Those pit tags give us a lot of information, but at $2 a piece, it's not bad unless you're tagging several thousand fish. These coated wire tags are more like 10 cents a piece. So great for mass marking large cohorts. And since this cohort started at a size of about 10,000 fish, 
10 cents is a little bit better than two bucks a piece. How many fish are we gonna be tagging and, and releasing today? So we tagged these fish a month ago and we're just looking for the tags that they have right now. Got it. Today, we're gonna to be releasing 2,200 snook as part of a larger experiment where 7,500 fish will be going out in the water. We have another 3,000 fish in another holding facility that we'll be putting out as another experiment. All of these are from the same cohort. The last three years, our spawning efforts have been able to produce 10,000 taggable fish that we're releasing throughout Southwest Florida to look at how their survival changes over time in different locations, and really based on the different protocols that we use putting these fish out into the water. That's, that's crazy. Like, yeah. There's so many fish, there's a lot of working hands here right now. It's a really big operation. Yeah, we'll have a single cohort produce three different release experiments, and when we have tagging or release events, it's all hands on deck. We take all the volunteers that we can help move these fish through the process and get them into the water safely. That's awesome. I, I gotta get my hands on one of these fish. Is that, is that cool for Absolutely. check it out? Absolutely, go for let's, it. Let's take a look, let's check it out. Come in here, catch a few fish, and get them ready for Justin so that he can scan them. And as he pulls fish out, you keep replacing them. Sound good? All right, John. So here's our pit tag scanner. Yep. Once we know that, once we see our little blue light, it's ready to read, we go ahead, Give it a scan. If it doesn't have a pit tag, we Double go check. through here. This is looking for the coated wire tag. And now we repeat a thousand times, so we get all thousand fish out there. And that just helps us understand our, our tagging efficiency. And then we were able to go out, if we recapture these fish, every single fish with a tag represents a proportion of the population. We've tagged about 15% of the fish with pit tags so that we can get uh, more accurate information on that subset and apply our survival estimates that we get from the pit tag fish to the entire cohort. At our release sites, we have pit tag antenna arrays that are out there looking for those pit tags 24 hours a day, seven days a week, such that just as when that tag went past the scanner, we know which individual was scanned. When that fish swim past our antenna array out in the field, we know it's what individual, was at that part of the shoreline, when they were there, and even how long they stayed. And obviously, most importantly, we know that this, that fish still survived. And by getting continuous detections of all these pit tag fish over time, we're actually able to generate recapture histories that feed into mark recapture models that give us the survival estimate of this cohort. The reason we do this experimentally is trying to determine what that variability in survival is and what those key factors influencing survival may be so that we can continue to improve our survival rate. When you put fish in the wrong place at the wrong time, we've seen survival rates as low as maybe 5%. But you hit the right place at the right time and use the right protocols, some of the best survival rates of our cohorts are pushing 30 to 40% survival. So if we're releasing 10,000 fish and 40% of those fish survive, obviously we can have a pretty good impact on that population that we're trying to help recover. But if we put them in the wrong place at the wrong time or use bad procedures, we really haven't been effective at our mission. And that's why we continue to release fish at different times of the year and in different locations uh, in order to try to figure out what that combination of time, sp space, and protocol helps us maintain efficient and high survival rates post-release. Typically, if you're releasing fish and relying on physical recaptures to see those fish again, you'd be lucky to see 10% of those fish after several years of effort. With our pit tags, we'll often see 70% of those fish again within that first month post-release and maybe up to 30, 40% again thereafter. And that allows us to actually estimate survival of our fish within one year after release. So we don't have to wait year after year after year to try to understand our influence uh, we can conduct an experiment, put those fish out with one within a year, know what the experimental results are, and change our protocols for that very next release. And that helps us accelerate our improvement. Snook like calm still water. So we have minimal flow. So we like to come in, we have to come in and we brush these tanks out. But all that waste goes into this trough that runs the length of the building. And it goes down to a drum filter. So all the water passes through a screen that's automatically cleaned and takes those sediment and solid waste out back 
to be further processed. Because this system works on 100% recirculating salt water, we want to make sure that every last drop of water stays in the system so that you could be doing this type of grow out any place in the US. You don't have to necessarily be right next to a source of salt water if you have this type of technology. We're located miles inland, but we're still able to operate without trucking water in all the time because we more or less save every drop of salt. We can always add fresh water. It's salt that's critical in marine recirculating aquaculture systems. Once all the solid wastes are removed, it goes through this giant moving bed biofilter. Here we have these little spaghetti noodles that some people like to call them. It's kind of what they look like. They harbor the bacteria community that takes the um, less ideal byproducts, the nitrogen, the nitrate and ammonia, or sorry, nitrite and ammonia, and it takes those and it converts it into nitrate, something that's not as hazardous uh, to the fish itself. And then that water goes through our giant UV filtration in a way, so we maintain and reduce the bacteria and viral loads in the system so that that water stays clean, and then it gets bumped, pumped back into the tanks. So Dr. Ryan, this, uh, this building is huge and it looks like we've got a lot of different rooms in here. We got huge filtration tanks. What are in all of these rooms? This is where we house all of our broodstock populations. We have snook broodstock, red drum broodstock, and Elmico jack broodstock for all the different research that we're trying to do here at the aquaculture park. We're not only producing fish for stock enhancement, we're trying to produce fin fish for feeding the future. A lot of the species that we eat, that seafood is imported from outside the U.S. We want to have oh, wow. safe, sustainable seafood here in the U.S. So we are having food fish production and we want to keep our wild fishery sustainable as well. So we're looking at stock enhancement to help them out as well. That's awesome. I, I, right now I'm looking and I just see these like huge filtration tanks. Um, and I figured like if the tanks are this size, I can only imagine how big the actual holding tanks with all the, with all the fish are and how big that is. These tanks are 10,000 gallon tanks, 20 feet in diameter, six feet in depth. And we recirculate and clean the water, not only at the source in these tanks, but across the entire park to keep our fish healthy. Wow, this is, uh, this is massive. I didn't think, how many gallons in total do you have for all the tanks that are here? Oh, more than I know. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. We gotta check out some of these fish. Let's go take a look. Maybe Matt would like to share a little bit about the history of the Snook broodstock here and what we do to keep the broodstock healthy and just show you some fish. So this is the broodstock facility. We've got uh, four 15 foot diameter tanks on this side. We got three 20 foot diameter tanks over here. The uh, Almaco Jack are in all of these uh, tanks over here. We have our red drum broodstock in here. And then the last two tanks down there are common snook. Um, all the fish that we deal with here are wild fish. So fish that we captured from the wild and um, brought in. Uh, so what we do is we uh, use photothermal manipulation to try to get them to spawn. So all that means is that um, we control the temperature and the lighting because most fish are seasonal spawners. They don't spawn year round. So what we have to do is emulate the natural environment as best as possible. Set the mood. Yeah. yeah. In these tanks, because, you know, it's difficult. We, the fish are in tanks, so we've got to try to make it as natural as possible to get them to reproduce. Some of them are what we call fully volitional spawners. So that means they spawn without any, um, well, without any help from us. Let's just put it that way. Uh, what we use, uh, for example, the common snook are not fully volitional spawners, so they won't spawn without any help from us. Now, red drum and the almacos are fully volitional. So by manipulating their photothermal cycles, we can actually get them to spawn without us doing anything to them. So if you want to, we can go in the room. I'll show you the red drum. They do get a little skittish with people around, so we'll see if they'll feed. First, they are a little Pavlovian train. I would have a hard, we don't sample them often anymore. Um, conversion, weight wise, uh, 55 pounds. 
You guys got lucky. They usually don't like a lot of people hanging out over the tank. So they're hungry this morning. Yep. This is the newest Snook broodstock population that we have on site. They were just caught within this last year. The older Snook broodstock is next door. So we have two Snook broodstock populations that we use to support our stock enhancement research. Uh, this is not a species that we're growing for as a food fish uh, because they do have slower growth. Species like Red Drum, Almaco grow much faster to a marketable size. So that has not been our key interest for Snook. It has just been for our stock enhancement research. So what will happen in our sampling is we'll actually take these fish and mix them. So we'll take the old fish, mix them with some new and have two separate populations where we have some newer fish and some older fish. Um, we need to, you know, with keeping them in captivity for so long, we have to worry about cycling them in and out, burning the fish out. So that's why we constantly replace fish. Um, there's other, you know, reasons down the road that we'll have to, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. Yeah, so, once we start to be able to produce sufficient numbers of fish that we're releasing, we are concerned about the genetics and any potential genetic impacts. So these broodstock are completely locally sourced. We have a very limited range that we're able to stock these fish into. We can go pretty much from Tampa Bay to Charlotte Harbor. If you wanted to do stock enhancements, <laughs> Don't look at me, look at those fish. <laughs> you had our attention until I asked. Yeah, that was way cooler than anything I could say. But if we wanted to do stock enhancement down uh, in the Everglades or on the East Coast, you'd have to have a different population of snook with those local genetics. So these brood stock have been on site... Depends. Eight uh, years-ish now? <clears throat> Let's see. At the oldest? I thought I saw 2013. Yeah, the oldest is about 2013. Yeah. So up to eight years, this population's been with us and we've been spawning them. As I said, we do want to be mindful of the genetics because we've only started now being able to release in much larger numbers. We're not at that point where we have a concern of a potential genetic <laughs> impact, but we do work with FWC to monitor the numbers of fish that we release. And as Matt mentioned, we're starting to set up that plan of cycling in new brood stock in advance of getting to that point where genetics could ever be a concern. Whereas this is an awesome species for Ryan as far as a stock enhancement per perspective, it is a, well, I won't say miserable, it is a horrible species for me from an aquaculture perspective. Uh, because we do have, they don't fully volitionally spawn. So the cues in the wild that or they spawn two to three days post new and full moon. So we've tried doing lunar cycling. That's what the light up there was for. That didn't work. They also spawn on outgoing tides. So we've tried directional flows, switching the direction the tank is flowing. And that didn't work. They spawn in the summertime. We don't know if the freshwater influx from all the rain in the summer causes something to, uh, for them to spawn. We're not sure exactly what mixture of cues or a specific cue causes them to spawn. So we just haven't get, gotten them to fully volitionally spawn in here. The other thing is they produce very, very tiny eggs. So like I said, 720 microns or 0.72 millimeters. Um, so most reefs, most reef fish produce eggs about that small. And you're talking about a large species here and they don't produce you know, high number, or they produce high numbers of eggs, just very tiny. So yeah, the, it's not so much that the egg is the problem, it's the larvae that hatches out from that egg. So we have to have a feed, we have to have a prey organism that they can not only eat, that's nutritious enough. So finding out, you know, finding the smallest uh, zooplankton that we can feed them so that they can act, we can actually have uh, good survival once they hatch out. Uh, we had to work with the nutrition of the brood stock in order to get more uh, viable eggs from them. But when we implant them, this tank right now, if we were to get in and implant and spawn them, which wouldn't work because right now they're resting, but let's just say if we did, each night, uh, the first night we'd probably get about, we'd probably collect three to four million eggs and about 75% of them would be fertilized. So. Now the other problem that we see with these fish is that um, 
there, well, and it's with a lot of fish that we deal with, with as far as the brood stock. There is a social hierarchy in the tank. At one point, this tank had 56 snook brood stock in it. Every female would be mature and implanted. And then when we would do the genetics work on them to look at who the mother and who the father was, we would see that two, maybe three females were contributing to the spawn and about three to four males were contributing. And that was about a one-to-one -one ratio of males and females in the tank. So we see this social dominance that happens in the tank and that's something that we'll have to address. The other problem is, is that they like these big tanks. So one thing that we did to address the genetics uh, problem that Ryan was just talking about was we have spawning tanks um, next door. And what these tanks are, they're individual uh, eight foot diameter tanks, but they're only about three foot in depth that we can put the fish into. So what we'll do is we'll get in, sample the fish, and then move them over there to get them to spawn. We attempted this for four years and had zero success with it because there's some dynamic with the, between the sampling, the stress from that, taking them, moving them to a different system, and then that system being completely different. We would get eggs from the females, but we would see almost no fertilization. It was just a big headache. We tried looking at different ratios of males and females. Uh, we incorporated uh, carbon filters to strip out any pheromones that they might be producing. Uh, what others, just different flow dynamics, flow rates. We tried a multitude of things over a four year period and just couldn't get it to work. So what the work is gonna have to involve now is actually genetically uh, figuring out which fish are socially dominant and then figuring out where our work's gonna be, whether maybe we pull those fish out for that spawn so that the other fish can spawn or we move them to another tank. The problem is, is right now all that genetics work is exorbitantly expensive and we just, we don't have the funds to conduct the work. Uh, but like Ryan said, once we do start releasing enough fish to where we could possibly have an impact that some we're going to have to address it eventually. All right. So we saw the big fish. All right. We've seen some of the smaller fish. What is this space right now? What, what do you have set up and, and what's its purpose? This space is our fisheries wet lab. We rear these fish in a couple different conditions. And when they're going out in the wild, they're going to experience a whole different habitat. In this system, we're trying to get them acclimated and understand the effects of our hatchery process on these releasable snook so that we can make sure that we maximize survival once they go out into the wild and have the biggest impact on that population that we can. So what are you looking at when they're in these tanks? Like, what is your focus of, of these tanks and making sure they, you know, survive well out in the wild? Yeah, every single release we do, every single cohort will have a different experiment. Today, we're looking at how salinity in their rearing environment can influence post-release survival. Snook are incredible. They can jump 15 parts per thousand without an issue and survive, at least here in our controlled conditions. But we don't have predators in our tanks. So will that same thing apply when we go out to a release site, when we have our planned experiment where we want to put fish in the water at this spot, but all of a sudden the tide's up and the salinity is five, 10 parts per thousand higher than we anticipated? What is the impact on that, on that release experiment? By measuring it with this controlled study, we'll be able to better assess the impact of the release location the release time and all of our protocols on survival of the cohorts that we're putting out there. Got it. So you have a bunch of different tanks and they're all at different salinities, right? Like, yeah. so I know that full strain seawater is like 33 to 35 parts. Okay. Freshwater is zero. So anywhere in between that range, you have different tanks and groups of fish in these different tanks at, at different salinity levels. And you're going to monitor long-term in this release, how well each group does to, on the different areas that you let them go, right? Exactly. Okay. We have fish being held in 5, 15, 25, and 35 parts per thousand. And every single fish in this experiment has one of those passive integrated transponder tags, that microchip that helps us know exactly which individual came from each of those tanks. So that when we release them and they happen to swim across one of our pit tag antenna arrays it picks it up. that's out on the field, we'll know that the fish from the five part per thousand tank did really well at this release site, but the fish at the 35 part per thousand tank didn't do so well. And where is that breaking point? 
is 15 parts per thousand okay? 25 parts per so thousand the okay? So the sweet zone, right? Where's that, yeah, where's the sweet spot? Yeah. So that when we know what our rear end conditions are, we can best match it with the release site, not only just in salinity, we're talking doing this with temperature, habitat, anything that might influence post survival. Any variable that you guys can manage and Prey control. Prey concentrations, wow. looking at predators, we're able to replicate that in these tanks and have a better understanding what happens in the field. That's a lot of moving parts to, to monitor and record, but honestly like- One part at a time. Yeah, how, and how many years has this operation been going on? It's only been getting better and better every year, but- We've been working with FWC on snook stock enhancement issues for 20 years. They're just an wow. incredibly difficult species to work with. Yeah. So as we climb the hurdle with maintaining healthy brood stock, climb the hurdle with having healthy larvae, transitioning them to these early juveniles, taking them all the way to those fingerling sizes that we're able to release today. Now we're actually having the numbers for these great controlled experiments to look at what happens in the hatchery and that how that hatchery experience influences their life out in the wild. Gotcha. All right, so now all these fish are tagged and they're all cataloged correctly. And now we're putting them inside this truck with FWC. We're gonna take this truck down 75 and drive it. It was a pretty interesting to see the whole thing sloshing around. We're actually gonna go to a, spe a specific spot that they've picked out that, that give these, these snook basically the best chance of survival. And what happens as soon as we get to the launch site is now it's these snook are all still in this big FWC truck and this tanker essentially, we are going to take these snook individually into buckets. You'll actually see the, the buckets being used, just five gallon buckets, one by one, into coolers that have little aerator pumps, into little trucks and, and uh, little rangers, and then taking them out to the actual launch site. And once at the launch site, then of course we're doing kind of the reverse process where we're getting them into little buckets again, and then slowly and very meticulously making sure we give these snook the absolute best chance of survival. So here we go. Here's our cooler full of snook Look ready to be released into this beautiful habitat. Big moment. In Tippecanoe Environmental Park. We'll just go ahead and hold the lid open, point down, turn, and let those fish swim free. And now they're gonna be exploring their new habitat. And if you look downstream, you'll see actually one of our antennas sticking up out of the water. So as these fish move and explore the park, anything that swims down that way, will hit that antenna, charge that pit tag, it'll send out a radio frequency ID so that we know exactly which individual went to that spot, when they were there, how long they stayed, and most importantly, that they still survived. Dude, this was the coolest thing ever. Like I. That was so awesome. We just released a bunch of snook out into the wild. We got a lot more to go. <laughs> Let's go get another cooler. Let's do it, man. All right, you ready to release our next cohort of snook? Let's do it. Fish. One at a time? One at a time, yep. Bunch of snook going in there. One at a time, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful fish. All ready? Right. Ready for big release? A lot of snook going free. Yeah, look at all those fish. That's awesome. Just like that, 500 fish found a new home. Woo. 500 snook out in the wild. We're catching those next year. Yeah. And the year after, and the year after, and the year <laughs> after, because they'll keep coming back to this spot. So, so now you know where to come cast. <laughs> so they marked it on their fish finder to come back. <laughs> <laughs> and we see it, because every time that they go out, they ping yeah. and ping in this gated system. They come back in, ping, ping, and we know right when they return home. Wow. All right, you guys, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. We spent that whole day with them. We learned so much about how they're helping manage our fisheries. And I mean, how cool is it that they essentially kind of get to, you know, play God, if you will, with these fish and recreate them and then put them in the water and then follow and track them, I think is so cool to see what the survival rate is and, and how many of these snook that start off at six to eight inches end up growing to 40 plus. I mean, how awesome is that? And so this is really just scratching the surface on what Moat and FWC is doing to help out our fisheries. And so we will continue to 
to hopefully partner up with them, do more with them. I got really, really pumped. And even my daughter, Shauna, get to saw, get to saw that. And she's like, man, I want to go back there again. So I would highly encourage you, if you haven't gone to Moat there in Sarasota, definitely check them out. They are just first class in everything they do. And also check out that Moat Aquaculture Center as well. That is another place that you can tour. The public can actually tour it. You got to sign up for it. But that is a really, really neat place as well. So I hope you enjoyed it. Please make sure to go follow Moat and FWC and make sure to subscribe to the Salt Strong podcast if you haven't already. And of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe on that below and join us in the Insider Club. If you haven't already, we just hit 25,000 members. We were just so excited this, uh, this past uh, month to celebrate that. And so thank you all so much for all the support, all of the love, and we'll talk to you on the next episode.